Hi, Stacy. Is there anything that um, you need specifically from me for this? Yeah, if possible, um, if you can mention or put in the chat, Connor Garcia and Anne Melissa Wolfter are our ASL interpreters. And so anyone who would need them to be pinned, um, if they could, if they know how, if they don't know how to pin, it's just the ellipsis also. And it says you can choose it on that person and then choose pin to first screen so that they're always showing for um, those who need the interpreters. Does that make sense? <laughs> yep. Okay, hang on, let me start. Uh, is it okay. Anne Melissa? Yes. Yes. Yes, well, we'll be able to um, monitor the chat, or would you like Stacy to help out with those two as well? Sorry, getting set up. Um, Stacy, are you able to monitor the chat for us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and if possible, if we could wait till the end to kind of address any questions, is that okay? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the room. We are here with uh, Jessica Starkey and Dr. Maria Mesa, who are um, joining us from the PPCC Accessibility Services 
um, department. And um, I'm just going to turn it over like that. Thank you so much, Maria and Jessica, for volunteering um, to lead this session. And um, I will be monitoring the chat room. Please let me know if you have any questions. Um, but we will be saving questions to the very end of the presentation. Thank you, Stacy. Right. Thank you, Stacy. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us uh, in our session, Equity Minded Teaching, Encouraging the Inclusion of Students with Disabilities. So our lineup um, really consists of Jessica and I will start off talking a little bit about ourselves and why we feel disability inclusion is a major part of changing the way we think about teaching and about engaging with students with disabilities. Um, the image on the slide depicts a row of side profiles of faces in different shades of color. Um, we, we are also going to share our, our words to live by, kind of our mantra. Uh, and then the discussion will take us through the understanding, um, points of understanding, so that as we use these words, we can also be on the same page. Um, then we will share some suggestions for intentionally moving forward. Uh, toward equity-minded teaching. And again, keeping in mind the inclusion of students with disabilities. Okay, so just a little bit about who we are. Um, the images on this slide represent uh, who we are. One picture is of a beach on Guam with people in the water and walking along the shore, representing that I am from the beautiful island of Guam. Uh, there is an arrow pointing to the second image, which has a diverse representation of children holding hands in a circle. Two of them are on a wheelchair, signifying my years teaching and coordinating special education services for almost two, two decades. Um, the arrow then points to the image in the middle of the slide, and that depicts a colorful silhouette of adult, uh, one with a service animal, uh, one using a walker, two using a wheelchair, two others walking. And this represents my work in accessibility services for over 10 years. Um, and this has really led me to realize my calling to encourage the inclusion of students with disabilities uh, as a diverse population, as an identity of intersectionality, uh, and really to help advocate for equity-minded change within institutions, in the classroom support offices, within the on the campus. So this, Equity minded, minded teaching is it's really important to me because I myself, I, I identify myself as a BIPOC or an API, Asian Pacific Islander, indigenous to the island of Guam. I am Chamorro Japanese. Um, and with whom and what I identify myself as, I also grew up in a lower socioeconomic class um, status. I am a brown female with invisible disabilities. So advocating for myself, was really necessary, uh, but it wasn't easy. So being able to help others understand and uh, the positive impact of equity mindedness and making changes to the mindset within academic institutions has really empowered me to share my story of educational success. So I think back and on my island, on Guam, we are a matriarchal society. So I grew up in a space, but I grew up in a space um, where women were quiet and just did their jobs. And that's interesting because we're a matriarchal um, and disabilities weren't really discussed. So we see even there within my own culture, um, there exists intersections within our own intersectionality. And we'll talk a little bit more about this as well, but welcome. Hi, everybody. Welcome and thanks for coming. So the images that represent me on this slide include uh, a picture of the lakefront city and suburbs of Chicago with an arrow pointing towards a drawing of students in a classroom with hallway and lockers behind them. So I'm originally from the suburbs of Chicago. When I moved to Colorado almost 20 years ago, one of my first jobs was as a paraprofessional with a severe needs population at a high school. Among the many students that I was lucky enough to work with, I worked very closely with a student on the autism spectrum who was told from a very young age that he'd never graduate from high school. Not only did he graduate from high school, but in my time here at PBCC, I saw him graduate college. I'm passionate about knocking down walls for students with disabilities, helping them find opportunities, watching them realize their potential, 
and reaching a goal that they're often told is not possible. In addition to working with those incredible students, two of my children also have disabilities, and I myself have several disabilities, invisible disabilities as well. My children and I identify with several diverse categories, which drives me to make changes for the world that I'm raising them in. Equity is important to me, both personally and professionally. So then there are two arrows pointing down to the final image, signifying how Maria and I have come to advocate for equity and inclusion of students with disabilities. It's a cartoon with different animals, a bird, a monkey, an elephant, a penguin, a fish and a fishbowl, a seal and a dog in a line in front of a large tree. The teacher sitting at a desk in front of them is saying, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please go climb that tree. And that, that image truly kind of represents one of the many issues that creates barriers for, for our students with disabilities in our schools. Uh, equity mindedness is an actionable movement. And this, it's based on the following mantra. And this is what I uh, mentioned earlier we were going to share. Let's get to that. Diversity is a fact. Equity is a choice. Inclusion is an action. And belonging is an outcome. And that's by Arthur Chan. And he is a DEI strategist with a background in psychology, in clinical psychology. Uh, and he has demonstrated uh, ex his experience in developing and evaluating DEI initiatives, policies, and programs. Um, so let's break this down just a little further because these are not just words. These are intentional concepts that can be used to develop equitable uh, policies and practices in our institutions. And then remember, equity-mindedness is an institutional responsibility uh, as it includes everyone, all personnel, faculty, staff, students. So the image on this slide is a group of people that re represent a diverse group with diverse gender identities and abilities with one person using a wheelchair. Diversity is a fact, but what is diversity? Merriam-Webster defines it as an instance of being composed of different, differing elements or qualities. No one could deny that there are many different elements or qualities within every single person which make us unique. We have different ethnic backgrounds, cultural belief systems, experiences, abilities, educational experiences, skills, gender identities. Even the way we look and smell and move and learn, our differences go on and on. Diversity also extends, ex exists between two people with the same disability. So two people with PTSD will not experience it in the same way. We must not make assumptions based on a student's diagnosis, but rather and acknowledge their value, their strengths, their experiences, traditions, and identities. We must value them as an individual and appreciate what they have to offer. When we say diversity is a fact, we're proclaiming how diversity is not just trending, it's not just a buzzword, it's not a passing fad, it's here to stay. It's visible and it's a tangible truth. So our mindset change begins not only with comprehending the definition of diversity, but understanding and acknowledging that these differences exist in the classrooms, in your offices, in your life. According to the Institute on Disability, if people with disabilities were a formally recognized minority group at 19% of the population, they would be the largest minority group in the United States. Individuals with disabilities intersect all walks of life, professions, races, religions, ethnicities, gender identities, sexual orientations, socioeconomic classes. Also, the disability community is the only minority group that anyone can become a part of at any time. If we dig deeper, we see how there is diversity within our diversity. It's called intersectionality. At the top, um, we see a quote by Dr. Jonathan Lamptey. Uh, he is an authority on DNI in the workplace, and he shared his description of intersectionality. So he said, I think that intersectionality addresses the complexity of being an individual by recognizing that everyone has multiple forms of identity. So intersectionality happens in society anytime a person has multiple forces of discrimination working against them. So this can happen in all different kinds of situations. But the term intersectionality or intersectional theory was coined in 1989 by Kimberly Crenshaw in a paper she wrote um, on intersectional feminism. 
Now she pointed out that the feminist movement experience and all its issues were different for black women because of their environment. So being a woman and black intersected to create a unique experience of discrimination. So for example, women's, the women's suffrage movement, which was greatly supported by black women, ultimately only the white women were given that privilege and allowed to vote. So we see there how the systems of power they worked against the intersectionality of black women. And when we talk about systems of power, we're talking about the norms and the rules that, that, that society uh, has adopted over time as a, the norm. So um, my example, I have an you know, experience. Um, so on average, women make less than men in the workplace. But being among, my, uh, among minority women, and I describe myself as an API as the minority of the minority, uh, I probably earn even less in the workplace or not offer the same opportunities as other females with social privileges. In this instance, my gender and ethnicity are interconnected or intersecting and creating further disadvantages for me. But on the flip side, because of the systems of power on Guam, on my island, I may actually have an advantage being a woman from Guam. Um, to have those opportunities or to get higher pay uh, than women who are not from Guam. So we're seeing intersectionality as a framework for understanding how social identities, which is not synonymous with diversity, um, how they overlap with one another and with the systems of power that oppress or provide an advantage for people. Our markers of identity, like ethnicity and disability, they don't exist separately. They all overlap when it comes to oppression and power. Intersectionality is not a code word for diversity. Again, it's a framework for understanding different people's experiences in the world. It's not about adding one identity to another. It is about how the overlapping identity experience the norms of society. So I am not a POC on one hand and a disabled person or a person with a disability on the other. I am a POC with a disability who experiences situations differently. And then that all depends on where I am or what I'm trying to attain. It's definitely a global phenomenon, a perspective that can be applied to institutions all around the world. So let's reflect on some things. As educators in the community college system, how do you show up to other people? How do you, what do you do to control how others perceive you? What parts of your identity put you in an advantageous or oppressive state, place, state, in a place? How do you see students in the classroom? Are you aware of your biases against disabled students, students with disabilities? When you provide the accommodations or implement accommodations in your classrooms, are your intentions to help our students based on sympathy, empathy, or your biases? Do you acknowledge the intersection of abilities and race and gender and, and, and? So when you think about this, the answers to all of these questions are really rooted in the mindset, in the equity mindset of intersectionality. It's not a new term, it's not a new concept, but it is central to the lives of the marginalized groups. So changing our mindset, so that we are putting equity at the forefront really begins with um, recognizing how intersectionality is like diversity, a fact. And we have to change these systems of power so that our society embraces the inclusion of disabled people, people with disabilities as the norm. So the image on this slide depicts several people from various ethnicities formed in a huddle with their hands together in the middle. So then we ask ourselves, how do we put this into practice? How do we make this an intentional action? So in intersectionality put into action, into practice. First, um, I'll describe the image on the slide, which depicts puzzle pieces that make up the shape of a human. In each puzzle piece is written an identity category for example, ability, race, class, gender. And this leads us to answering that question I just posed a few 
a few seconds ago, how do we put this into action? Well, here are a few tips to promote opportunity for individuals and communities who face intersecting forms of discrimination. We first really need to recognize systemic discrimination that block others from realizing their abilities or their strengths and their values in your classroom or when they walk into your office. We need to recognize that forms of systemic uh, discrimination, they also intersect with each other and they present very unique challenges for affected ind individuals. So for example, if a poorly dressed API uh, Asian Pacific Islander student with a disability walks into your advising office, Right, what possible oppressive assumptions may be made, can be made. So we may assume that the student has a language barrier, but why would you think that? Because she's API, right? So let me tell you, and then this is, this has happened to me in my lifetime. I couldn't count how many times I've been told, wow, you speak English good. And then I always respond with, thank you. I do speak English well. You know, so I've been asked, where did I learn English? Um, and for those who really want to know, English is the first language on Guam. It's my first language. Um, you may also assume, back to the API student, that students, um, you may assume that the student does not have, may not have the ability to pay for transportation, maybe food, housing, uh, education, and, and just based on what you are seeing them, uh, how you are seeing them, you know, what she's wearing or he's wearing. Um, and they are not, so then they don't get the 100% you would normally provide someone else needing advising assistance. And now let's address the disability issue. There is no dis disability issue. There is no issue. Disability is not an issue. It is not a problem. It is a part of a person's life. They learn different. The assumption is that they won't be able to be successful here in the college. So equity-minded teaching and engagement requires that we see these intersections as aspects of a person's identity. So how and why they are engaged, how and why they are discriminated or privileged depends on our mindset. And we need to make that change. So we also need to value their voice. So intersectionality requires recognition of the voice of those most directly impacted because frequently they're not included in the mainstream conversations. They've been excluded. We need to remember inclusivity, incorporate different perspectives when talking about certain courses in your uh, course topics in your classroom. If you are uh, talking with them in a student support office, um, remember their perspective counts. So when intersecting issues and cross issues, we need to be open to thinking creatively about social justice issues. We need to assess how issues connect with unrelated topics and then consider how they might have unintended consequences for them because of the way they perceive things as well. We need to strive to collaborate uh, with people and provide resources for them um, to promote this equitable change. And this connection to community, it amplifies the importance of respect and access to opportunity. So are we helping with their basic needs? Are we acknowledging that these individuals with intersectional identities, they face unique challenges in how they are perceived and in how they sustain themselves and how they, they show up, right? So as an institutional responsibility, we do need to include everyone in order for equity mindedness to be the new system of power, to be the new norm. So, and part of that change in mindset has a great deal to do with, again, understanding and recognizing what a deficit minded approach looks like. So the text on this deficit minded slide says, Emphasis on qualities that student lack or knowledge they should have. The image has a thought bubble listing uh, the following qualities. Discipline, how to learn, motivation, commitment, engagement, direction, navigate the university system, how to be a college student in time. So let's first identify what that deficit-minded approach is. We often have a tendency to think in a deficit-minded way, 
but this can result in lower le levels of learning. For example, we focus on what's broken and what needs fixing or weaknesses. Weakness is often a word associated with disability and it's a deficit-minded way of thinking. We should be focusing on what's working and emphasizing the strengths and possibilities of our students. Our problem solving can be externally driven, uh, such as things, expectations from others, grades, things like that. When co-constructing or working together with students is far more effective. It's internally driven and so much more impactful. We often find short-term short -term solutions to get by, but if we seek out sustainable solutions, learning is more lasting and meaningful. We rely on general knowledge. Things we think we know about certain disabilities or why a student would have a particular accommodation. Rather than learning each student's personal strengths and individuality, what they have to offer. We think reform and transition are the solutions. But if we allow students to be an active part of learning and creating, we can transform and invent, resulting in constant evolution for each person in situation. It can be easier to highlight past failures. But when we highlight past successes, we create space for future opportunities. We try to predict and control a situation, but discovery and surprise, creativity, thinking outside the box can lead to incredible outcomes. Now let's explore the equity-minded approach. So the image on this slide depicts five principles of equity-mindedness, and it's written inside a silhouette of a head. Uh, the equity-mindedness is evidence-based, it's systematic awareness, equity advancing, race conscious, and institutionally focused. Estella Bensimon, she is known for creating the term equity-minded, and her lifelong commitment to normalizing racial equity has helped higher education leaders and professionals improve their outcomes for minority students. So we've been talking about equity-minded excellence in context to diversity uh, and intersectionality so far. People with disabilities have a right to pursue their dreams without the limits of others' low expectations. So in order to understand and become equity-minded, it warrants us to assess and acknowledge that our current practices may not be working. And these inequities, they may be a dysfunction of our policies and practices. And these are things that we can control. So equity-minded practitioners, they question their assumptions, they recognize stereotypes that harm student success, and they continually reassess their practices to create change. So part of taking on this framework though, is that institutions need to become accountable for the success of our students. And they need to see this as our personal and institutional responsibility. So historically, educational practices and policies have treated all students the same. They've, they've been treated equal through curriculum and instruction, but mainstream instructional practices, they often don't align with the lived experience, experiences of historically underserved students, and that's to include students with disabilities. So an example, the positive contributions of marginalized people are often not included in course teaching. So famous people with disabilities, those who have uh, achieved greatness in the arts, innovation of technology, um, even those who have become our nation's leaders, their stories are not being told. College te teaching is um, historically largely dependent on a banking model. And in that model, instructors attempt to transmit or bank the content knowledge through teaching practices that tend to position our students as passive learners, right? And then you couple this with a curriculum that is more than likely not accessible for students with disability. So listen to these statements. These are statements that um, Jessica and I have actually heard instructors say to us. Um, She'll never be a nurse because of her disability. Or we've heard, he probably has PTSD because he told me he's a veteran. So instead of assuming what we don't know, equity-mindedness minded equity -mindedness compels us to acknowledge the value of our students with disabilities in our classrooms. It does not only suggest that we level the playing field, 
but that we affirm through thought and action, their inclusion, their strengths, their experiences, their cultural traditions, their identities that they present with, that they walk in with, walk in through our doors with into your classrooms or into your, your offices. So our hope is that you feel encouraged to think about our students with, with disabilities as capable and they're very motivated. They have goals like everyone else does and they will succeed, they can. So let's put this positive change into action through inclusion. The image on this slide states, disability inclusion is not about ADA compliance, it's about creating equitable, equitable experiences. So disability diversity on college campuses is no longer optional, it's an expectation. Students entering college today have grown up with the ADA. They've witnessed inclusion, mainstreaming of students with disabilities their entire lives. Some of the most powerful barriers to full inclusion include stigmas about students with disabilities, negative attitudes, technology barriers, and lack of understanding among campus administrators, faculty, and staff. Becoming an inclusive community takes work at all levels, from the top administration and board of trustees to faculty, to staff, and to the students. Inclusive cultures extend beyond the basic presence of students who have disabilities. It's not enough just that they're there. It encompasses both formal and informal policies, practices, and involves several core values, including the presence of people across, uh, with disabilities across campus, respect, for differences in learning styles, in flexibility, in tailoring curriculum, course lessons to the strengths and abilities of your students, asking them what they need. Equitable access to all resources, events, opportunities, including course materials and technology. When we hear, I treat all students equally and don't see disabilities, it's similar to saying I don't see color. Please be cautious. Remember intent versus impact. Although it may be intentional, this may indicate the inability to see differences and accept the diversity. Also, disability inclusion and equity is a campus-wide responsibility. Oftentimes, campus, leader, campus leaders, staff, faculty, they all turn to the disability support services on campus to help the students with disabilities access support services and academic accommodations. Because those offices have a critical role in supporting students, becoming an inclusive community takes work at all levels, from senior leadership to faculty, again, to staff and students. Research indicates that if a new student does not experience a sense of belonging within that first eight weeks of arriving at college, they'll be at a high risk of dropping out. This is particularly true for first-time students with disabilities, with 25% dropping out by the end of the first year and 35% dropping out by the end of the second. Inclusive culture is shaped by the attitudes of administration, staff, and faculty, and the lens through which the disability is viewed. Even when students do not experience outright hostility, stigma is likely to be the most prevalent barrier for the student with disabilities. To counteract common biases against students with disabilities, leaders at all levels of the institution must get involved. Inclusion on campus helps everyone to understand the common interests, goals, and aspirations. Now, there are many approaches to inclusion on the campus. For example, focusing on campus design and planning. What does it mean to create a campus that is welcoming and safe for all students? It includes attention to campus facilities and other physical spaces. This communicates our values and expectations and takes into account the different ways in which we move about learn, work, socialize, and it makes our campus more welcoming and invite, inviting. We should reflect on how language is used, how we refer to disability and people with disabilities or disabled people can be limiting. One way to change this detrimental attitude or stigma towards disability is to intentionally use more inclusive language that dignifies people's images and expectations. Using positive images of students with disabilities from various backgrounds can also help familiarize disability. It helps to ask yourself, are you, your staff, your students, your faculty nervous when talking about disability? Do you or your members of campus community feel that they need to behave differently around students who have disabilities? 
and how is disability portrayed on your campus or at your institution? We also need to build faculty capacity. Faculty may lack an understanding of inclusive pedagogy, so it's important to talk about disability bias and raise awareness about common disabilities. Faculty are more likely to adopt an inclusive teaching method and materials if they're more knowledgeable about the disability and understand that students with disabilities have limitations that arise from external barriers and not the students' inherent abilities. Faculty can initiate conversations with students about supports they may need or encourage them to consider the ways that they learn best. We always need to ensure that technology is accessible. Institutions should have a clear standard for accessibility when it comes to technology. We need to encourage responsibility and accountability. Leaders at all levels should be engaged in the guidance, the messaging, the measuring improvements and inclusion. All staff should clearly see their role in and contribution to inclusiveness, on the ground action among faculty, staff, and students needs to happen in tandem with support at the level of president, dean, chancellor, provost who embrace the disability diversity consistently and publicly. Maria, you're muted. Still muted, Maria. <laughs> Thank you. All right, sorry about that. So George Day in this slide, George Day is a Ghanaian born renowned educator, researcher oh. and writer. And he is one of Canada's foremost scholars on race and anti-racism studies. So the image on this slide is of George Day and he's quoted as saying, inclusion is not bringing people into what already exists. It is making a new space, a better space for everyone. Students today, they increasingly are, they come in more increasingly, increasingly more um, diverse in abilities, their cultures, the languages, uh, and learning modalities. And in order to move toward becoming more inclusive of all students, we must create a system of support that promotes learning and belonging. These inclusive practices, they're instructional and behavioral strategies that influence academic and social personal outcomes. There's no one size fits all uh, strategy and there are no special tool toolkits to becoming culturally and disability inclusive. Educators and institutional leadership, they must see inclusive practices as an approach to developing safe learning environments. And this, this can be done through thoughtfully planning instruction, strategically selecting and aligning the curriculum that meets the needs of our students. So throughout this discussion, um, we've mentioned how changing our way of thinking moves us toward equity-minded excellence and to include providing the same opportunities in education for our students with disabilities. So in the next couple of slides, uh, Jessica will share a few more concrete ways to engage with our students with disabilities in our classrooms or in our office offices. In traditional pedagogy, students are expected to be passive learners while instructors use the SAGE model of teaching where instructor lectures, students are expected to take notes, they need to memorize, they need to regurgitate information, and they get little or no immediate feedback. In contrast is the equity-minded pedagogy where students are active participants in their learning rather than spectators. Their input is valued and synthesized into the structure of the class. Co-learning increases communication, thinking skills, cultural awareness, Working with others also allows students to give and receive immediate and relevant feedback to make their learning more efficient. Working in a group allows students to provide checks and balances of their work on the spot, rather than finding out later to make their workflow more efficient. The cool thing is we all need these attributes. It's safe to say that learning from one another while being able to communicate effectively will never go out of style. In fact, we could be trending more and more in that direction in the future. Learning from one another is not only beneficial for students with disabilities, but for learners of varying abilities. Students 
including students with disabilities, often thrived when they feel like they're an active participant and that their identities are valued. <clears throat> this is how we work towards equity. When considering the deficit-minded versus equity-minded teaching, we need to keep several things in mind. Equal is not equitable. So expecting the same thing from each student isn't reasonable. So for example, let's consider Howie. Howie is a student in a math class. Howie has met with the disability services office at their school and has accommodations for their disability. One of the accommodations is that they can use double time for all tests and quizzes as needed. In a good faith effort to be helpful, Howie's instructor has doubled the test time for the entire class from one hour to two. This is considered equal, but it's not considered equitable. If the entire class can benefit from the two hours, it needs to be considered that Howie has been through the interactive process and based on their individual circumstance, it has been determined that they need to be able to use double the class time or now four hours. The instructor's intent was good, but the impact of not allowing Howie to use their approved accommodation for double time has not respected the individual student's need. Let's now look at some ideas for making your materials more inclusive. These suggestions can also be applied towards student support offices as well. Avoid ambiguity. Let students know exactly what to expect from your class. Confusion about instructor availability and class expectations can be avoided with clear wording in your syllabus. Use friendly and inclusive language. Your syllabus will be your student's first impression of your class and can be the deciding factor if they're going to remain enrolled. Students refer to the syllabus often during the course of the class, so choosing the correct language is important. For example, let them know your goals and what you offer them rather than what you expect them to do. Be inviting. Avoid exclusive language. For example, use we and us rather than you and I. Use preferred or neutral pronouns. Acknowledge diversity, express equity. Let students know that you want them to be successful in your class. Welcome feedback. Help students feel like they're an important part of your class and that their thoughts and their experiences are valuable. Here are some suggestions for creating inclusion and equity in your space. The image on this slide is of several people in a lecture classroom. Make your space inviting. Create a space so that students feel welcome in your room. Offer choice and collaboration. Learn what works best for each student's learning to increase their success in your class. Provide information in multiple ways. Digital accessibility has been a really great solution for so many students, but it's also created a barrier for some. Offer as many means of engagement as possible. Give frequent feedback, this is super important. Often as times a student is not aware of the areas that they need to work on until they're struggling. Giving them frequent feedback helps guide them in a more timely manner. Record your classes, your lectures, your meetings. Our goals as educators is to help students gain knowledge Offering recordings of their classes or your conversations allows a student to re-listen and review as needed to get the most out of what was said. Offer multiple means of communication. What works for one student may not work for another. Some students are able to get their ideas across better in an email, while others value a meaningful conversation with you where they can interact and ask questions as well explain the points that they're trying to get across. Here's an idea too, get to know your students. One idea is to pass out an index card at the beginning of the semester. Ask the students if there's anything that they would like you to know about them, to include their preferred pronouns, preferred name, family, transportation, personal information, or anything else that they choose to share. Let them know that it's not required, of course, but let them know also that you'd like to support them in your class. Again, many of these ideas can be applied in any classroom or support office on campus. Now let's visit some dimensions of inclusive excellence. Now, while we review, I would like you to ask yourself which of the following of these is true. I already do this in my class. I sort of do this, but I could make it more explicit or visible. I'd like to try this and I'm not sure how this would be appropriate for my course. The list is meant to provide additional ideas for inclusive practices in the context of teaching and learning. 
So we have intrapersonal awareness or adopting a cultural humility approach that constantly examines how ideas, assumptions, values, influencing, influence teaching approaches and relationships. Some examples of this include recognizing and changing in the moment when you're operating out of stereotypes, privilege, and or dominant cultural beliefs. Critically examining your own ideas, your culture's assumptions and values, and how those beliefs impact your pedagogy and interaction with others. Ask questions and seek information before disagreeing or defending your position. Maintain awareness of your early war warning signals when you begin to feel personally triggered during any discussion related to inclusion. We also have interpersonal awareness or connecting with students by understanding their perspective and amplifying the viewpoint to build authentic caring relationships. Examples of this include creating opportunities in each class meeting for interpersonal dialogue where multiple positions are honored. Assist students in identifying the differences and similarities in shared opinions, and then point out that importance of the diversity. Early in the start of the course, invite and engage students to co-construct class norms, for example, ground rules, using principles of inclusive environments. Provide ample opportunities for students to learn about and with and from each other. Foster opportunities for group work. We have curricular trans transformation. So selecting course content and teaching in a way that is relevant to all of your students. Some examples for this one, use visuals that signal diversity, but do not reinforce stereotypes. Consider the impact of your reading list. Choose readings that consciously reflect the diversity of the contributors to your field. When you invite guest speakers, ensure that they have varied backgrounds and experiences and recognize how your choices of materials, readings, examples, analogies, and content reflect your perspectives, your interests, and possible biases that may exclude others. A lot of suggestions and really great ideas for, um, for all of us. And I believe these great ideas our leadership and, and educators need to really reflect upon in order to put it into action to make these changes. So thanks, Jess. Um, these are just a few suggestions we have for all of you. Let's see, it is about 12 o'clock, um, but you know there is so much work, more work to be done. Uh, institutional change, again, begins with us. We will continue to repeat that, right? We, we need to make sure it, it is a mindset. We need to be allies in this movement for cultural change and equity-mindedness. Um, equity-minded teaching and engaging students with disabilities, it requires us to acknowledge and respect individual experiences and abilities. Learn about the different disability types. Uh, leverage your position in your institutions to promote and encourage the accessibility and inclusion of students with disabilities and yield the floor to them. Value their voices. They play a huge part in identifying and eliminating these barriers. Um, so let's make this commitment to institutional change, to include, to, to be inclusive and include the students with disabilities. Um, if you have any questions or suggestions or just want to continue this conversation, let us know. On this slide, we do have our um, contact email and it's maria, maria.mesa at ppcc.edu and jessica.starkey at ppcc.edu. So we thank you so much. If you have questions, of, of course, you can either unmute or use the chat. We would love to continue this discussion, um, but thank you so much for spending your time with us. We realized the other set, uh, sessions were also very interesting. Uh, and amazing. So joining us today at this time, it really means a lot to us and we appreciate you. Yes, thank you guys. Hi, I have a quick question. Um, would it be possible to uh, get copies of the, the, um, the PowerPoint presentation um, so I can refer back to it later? 
Yeah, I'll be reaching out to all of the presenters following um, today's presentations and any materials that are made available will be posted onto the website along with recordings. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yes. Hey, so our presentation is actually, we are at the end of it, um, but Jess and I can hang out here for a few more minutes if you have any questions. Does it help, uh, I guess, uh, so as someone who will, in my future use an accessibility, does it help students feel more at ease when you also present with a disability? Are, are you asking if it, if it makes me feel more comfortable? Yeah. Um, you know, I'll be honest, I, I, have not disclosed this to many people. So doing this today um, was kind of an eye opener for me, but absolutely Jacqueline, <laughs> it did feel, I felt a little nervous and I thought, well, you know, the whole point of this was to make sure that we are included, right? And that people see us with the identity of having a disability um, as human right and and to be able to treat us all the same so yeah absolutely yeah it's, nice it's kind of crazy I have an ox I carry an oxygen bottle obviously and um I've watched people look at me look at the bottle and then decide not to talk to me and that's horrible yes. yeah and I was like I am one of the smartest people I know <laughs> and you're good like we could have had great conversations. And you know what, Jacqueline? And this may be horrible to say, but you know, it's their loss. <laughs> they really could have had a great conversation with you. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. I hear you. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So um, I'm actually in career services uh, mm -hmm. at Red Rocks. I thought that my thing would have changed over, but I guess not um, the name. So I work in career services, um, person with a disability myself, um, but I, I'm i noticing that some of the, the more invisible disabilities are coming up more frequently um, in interactions with um, trying to find a job or an internship in particular. And I'm wondering um, if that's anything that you've worked on, because I know your kind of focus on this presentation was um, in teaching, um, but any tips for interacting with students um, and promoting disability awareness in kind of the student affairs side of things? So because we do more of the academic accommodations, we don't touch so much of the employment stuff, if that's kind of what you're asking. Um, right. We have, Maria, help me with what the office is called now. Um, Sylvia's office is doing Career services. Okay. So they're actually doing trainings on just that. They're helping students, you know, they have pre people presenting on. Really? Yeah. Um, so it's career services at Pikes Peak. Yes. And her name is Sylvia Garcia. If you put your email in the chat and I'll reach out to Sylvia. Yes, please. Because that's something that I think Red Rocks desperately needs. I think all of the community college career services could use some training on that. I didn't know that uh, Sylvia was doing that. I, I've worked with her on a few other oh. things for other stuff. Mm -hmm. really yeah. cool. So let me try so my had, time to reconnect. Yeah, she's yes. had um, some presenters. She's having workshops and things that, you know, we're going to be invited to. Uh, so she's going to be an incredible resource for that. Right. Because I know for there's a CCCS career roundtable and we've had 
a speaker, um, well, two speakers from the, oh, got to think here, uh, Voc Rehab that have come in and talked. Um, but I think I would like to take it a step further because I had those guys come in and speak too. Mm -hmm. So that's exciting. Thank you for that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's just, it's it's one of those things when you have a disability yourself, you're more likely to notice it yeah. and notice kind of the pinch points. And I'm I'm just noticing pinch points all over the place. And it's um, a little bit frustrating to me. Well, and a lot of students don't necessarily know the questions to ask after education. So right. if they're thinking- Yeah, and there's, um, mm -hmm. and there's a huge drop. One of the studies that I did, um, uh, with um, uh, in my graduate program was looking at um, career uh, educational rates, or not educational rates, I'm blanking this morning, um, employment rates for students with um, high functioning, what's considered high functioning autism. I don't like that word, but um, after they complete college because there is a drop off of services mm -hmm. um and how can we smooth out that drop off of services um because i think that's that's becoming uh, people are becoming aware of how that is affecting um employment rates absolutely yeah so yeah. See, I want to say thank you for bringing up that topic because I'm trying to put together the internship program for us here at Otero. And both of my children are on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. I've got my son who is five. He's not as high functioning as my daughter is. But at the same time, that's been a concern for me and the wife on, you know, whenever they get out of school whenever they get older in life, how, how are they going to go about, you know, their job and this and that. And I've got a student in the program that I'm instructing here at OC that he's on the spectrum and it's, it gets interesting at times trying to explain it mm -hmm. to him, you know, to where they understand it. Um, I've got another student who's in a wheelchair that I I haven't been in a wheelchair. So some of those things are, you know, new to me on, because I, I teach welding here at OC. And for me, it's, you know, how, how do I accommodate this with some of the standards that we have in place? And for that, I would highly recommend leaning on your disability services office. Um, you know, bringing those physical concerns, you know, of course, with welding and things like that to them. I know that here we have accommodated one or two students in welding that were in wheelchairs. So there are things that are possible, recognizing the safety concerns and things like that, and the technical standards and everything else. So lean heavily on your disability services office for those things. Yeah. So I know we've we've got him a wheelchair that will stand him up and kind of help get him into better position, but then he's limited with the straps, mm -hmm. with the harnesses, and it's just one of those things of how do we go about you know accommodating. So mm -hmm. that's I've been listening in on this, and I'm just trying to you know get some ideas, different information. But like I said, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. I think from personal experience, when it comes to, to um, accessibility, physical uh, um, accommodations, I think a lot of students, a lot of people understand that they might not have the ability to do things the way they're normally done. But if somebody approaches it with genuine curiosity um, and genuine empathy and says, I don't know if this is possible. Let's try a few things. Let's get creative. Um, and if it doesn't work, if ultimately it's a safety um, issue or in the case of like a job, it's you're just 
not able to perform some of those job duties, how can we work around that or get you into a position that's going to be um, less stress um, on you, you know, overall. So I think you're doing the right thing, Seth, by approaching it in a very empathetic way, in a very creative way to try to, to see if there's a workaround. And of course, when we talk about accommodations with students for any program, we do let them know that accommodations that we do can't um, impact the course competencies, the essential elements of what that course or that you know, exam or program or anything um, are trying to, to reach. Um, so we, we look at accommodations with that in mind, keeping the integrity of your course while making sure that the student has the, the access. So it's a fine balance. There is a, a question in the chat. One of my biggest problem is recognizing problems and not being allowed or able to help because the student will either not seek or allow help. Any suggestions? Yeah, oof, because that's a tough one. Um, because you know, in the college setting, it's, it's student discretion, right? If they want to seek out help, we're always here for them. Um, what we do, at, at PPCC often is we do reach out to um, instructors during professional development week, things like that. Uh, and we try to get in there to let instructors know, at least start there because we can't force students to reach out for help. So we kind of rely on the instructors in their classrooms and, and even in student support in their offices to say, you know, these are really great supports. Why don't you just go over there and ask for information? You know, and, and then at that point, if they meet with a disability specialist, um, it's not like we're recruiting, but we really want to let them feel like that's what we're here for to help them, right? So that's a tough question, Michelle, because you're right. If we're not allowed to, or the student doesn't seek out the help, you know, how, how do we reach them? And that's, this, that's this, a tough one. This has been a, a problem. I teach a CTE class. So most of it is autism spectrum or other similar problems. And you can recognize that it exists. You can see it. You can't ask about it. If, even if they volunteer it though, many of them will totally refuse any kind of help. And then it's so frustrating to know it's there, to know that we might be able to do something if they would accept the help, but they don't. And uh, I just wondered if there was any other routes we could take to get through to them. But I appreciate your talk. It was very good. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Stacy, we've got two minutes. Yeah, we um, we can close out if you're ready, but um, officially at 12.15, we'll close it up and allow people to have a quick break for lunch before we head um, into session um, number two. And there are four options for session number two, all also available um, linked from the website. Thank you so much. Jessica and Maria for volunteering and providing your time and expertise um, for folks from all across our state and, and system. Um, and I don't know if you noticed, we also have staff uh, or faculty from CMC and Ames joining us today. So wide reach, um, so really good work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great, great weekend. Thank you, and Melissa, for being here. That looks like Connor is still here also. Thank you, Connor, for your work. Are you, um, do you work for PPCC or are you outside of the system, the two of you? We both work for PPCC. Awesome. Are you often um, hireable by 
system office if needed in the future, or I just don't know how, <laughs> how does that work? Um, I'm honestly not too sure how that works either. Uh, I can, um, I can always give you uh, our, our coordinator's email uh, because yeah. she usually handles um, coordinating, obviously. Uh, but, uh, and I'm sure, I'm sure she could help you with that because I know that uh, she uh, gives, gets, gets us the work when we need it. Yeah, that would be great. Um, I would love to connect with her on, on potential future needs. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and close this room out. You all enjoy your lunch. Bye.